Hello everyone and welcome to episode 25 of the History Hotline. Today we will be talking about the organisation of women of African and Asian descent, otherwise known as OAD. And of course it is International Women's Day if you are listening to this on the day of release. If you're listening in March 2021, it's International Women's History Month. So that's why we'll be focusing on women and I thought why just focus on individual exceptional women you know, in the West, when we think about history, it's often individualistic and exceptionalism. And whilst there were not some exceptional and wonderful individuals historically um, across the board, I think it's very important that we think about these organisations, um, especially an organisation like OAD and the legacy that they left in regards to women's activism in Britain, especially women um, who were black, who were Asian from the Caribbean, from Africa um, and countries um, like that. So today we'll be thinking about OAD. But before we get into that history, it's, of course, um, Women's History Month. And I said that throughout this month, we will be looking at charities and organisations organizations and just illuminating their work um, as a way of I think not necessarily giving back but just highlighting the fact that you know as we speak about today especially this history and this grassroots community organizing that OAD did these are the legacies that have been left and these charities that are doing the work today in some ways carry on that tradition um, of helping black women um, and women uh, more widely who um need need the help in today's society um and so i wanted to to shout out some charities so this week the charity that i wanted to highlight was women for refugee women and their kind of manifesto um, and how they create change is firstly by empowering refugee and asylum seeking women to speak out become leaders and advocate for change through things like English lessons, drama and other activities, they help support women build their confidence and their skills because there is um, a level of isolation that's often felt by refugee women seeking asylum and it creates pathways and um, you know ways for women to rebuild their lives in Britain with dignity. It also aims to influence women um, in order for the population and the public to also have an understanding of what it means to seek safety in the UK. Um, It basically trains women um, that might have gone through those experiences to speak out at public events um, in the media in order to change the narrative, which is often quite negative about asylum seekers um, and refugees, and it's often very inaccurate about um, what these people might face. And, of course, they strive for change They publish research um, about the experiences of refugee women and work with policymakers in order to make the process of seeking asylum more fair. They have a campaign called Set Her Free against the detention of refugee women. Um, There are many uh, refugee women detained at Yarlswood, which is a detention centre in this country right now, even in a pandemic um, where the risk of infection and catching COVID is is so rife um, and COVID is, you know, developing new strains every day and running rampant through through society. But, you know, they are still being detained in these poor, poor facilities. And so they believe that above all, women should have the right to safety, dignity and liberty, which I don't think is too much to ask. Um, And that is the work that they're doing. So you can donate, you can fundraise, you can volunteer, you can get involved yourself. You know, if you feel like this charity speaks to you in any way, then please give your time, give your money if you can, or raise awareness um, of the charity and the work that they're doing, because I think the work they're doing is exceptional. And I think it perfectly fits into this episode of women organising for women um, and helping them settle in this country. Okay, so today we are focusing on OAD, as I've said, the Organisation of Women of African and Asian Descent. OAD emerged in the late 1970s and it's known today as the grandmother of feminist movements in Britain. And I'm not going to refer to it as a feminist movement again after this point because of the founders, um, their experiences of feminism and their shall we say opinions of feminism and the feminism that they were seeing in the 1970s in Britain and so I'm going to refer to it as a women's movement and it is a women's umbrella organization and a national one at that it's not one that just focused on London whilst a lot of the conferences were in London and the talks it did bring together 
women's movements from across the country and on a global level as well. Many of the women involved in OAD also worked with projects or campaigns that were anti-imperialist in their own countries or any movements abroad that also fit in with their politics. So the politics were being broadly socialist. Not everybody obviously was of that um, political leaning. However, it was a movement that was kind of born out of of working class struggles. And so for it to be anything else would be quite strange. It's a national umbrella organisation, as I've said. It's not necessarily a movement or charity in and of itself. However, it encompasses many different movements, organisations and women's groups from around the country. And they were able to come together under this OAD banner and umbrella and ground their politics and ground their organising and their activism within the framework of, of, of OAD. It was the first leading um, black women's group to be formed nationwide. And I think, I wouldn't say it's the last, but we haven't really had anything like it since, I would say. So with OAD, you know, you may not have ever heard of it before. Um, And if you have, you may have heard of it through um, a book called The Heart of the Race that was written by Stella Dadzi, Beverly Bryant and Suzanne Schaaf. And they are three of the founding members, alongside Olive Morris, who you probably will have heard of if you've heard of any of them, um, Gail Lewis and Gerlin Bean, amongst many others. And a lot of these women have gone unnamed. If it wasn't for the Black Cultural Archives and the work of um, The Heart of the Race, the book, and then the collections that Stella Dazzy, Beverly Bryan, Suzanne Schaaf and others have kept and put into the Black Cultural Archives and preserved, we wouldn't know this history. It's a very hidden history. The history of black women in Britain is hidden. It's erased, it's removed, and we don't see it. And if I had not gone to the Black Cultural Archives um, in search of a dissertation project a few years ago, I wouldn't know this history. It's not something that I've even been taught in university bearing in mind I never actually studied a module on black British history I know that if you do you would definitely learn about these women but I think the fact that I had to go all the way to the archives um to kind of know this and find this history out shows just how hidden it is and so to go on OAD um you know was founded by these women in order to discuss and address black and Asian women's issues, women of African descent, so women that came from the Caribbean, from different countries in Africa, and also Asian women. And you might be thinking, well, why Asian women? You know, their their struggles might be different. They don't necessarily look like black people, might not have been treated the same way as black people um, in Britain at that time. However, you have to remember that at that time, you have a lot of Asians migrating to Britain from countries in Africa, such as Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Zambia, Malawi. And so in conversations about who this organisation would serve, Asian women from Africa um, would kind of ask the question, well, you know, do we fit into this movement? What about us, essentially? And so the framework was extended um, from just being people, women of African descent, to then focus on also women of Asian descent. But in some ways, it didn't really matter. And I'm thinking, well, of course it mattered. It's like watering down the politics, but not really because when I explain to you the roots of, of some of these women and the political groundings that they had before coming into OAD, it will make sense to you why this big umbrella doesn't really matter. And also the fact that it was an umbrella and not a women's movement in and of itself. You know, it wasn't just an organisation for one cause or for one type of woman. It was an umbrella. And I'm not going to stress that enough in this um, podcast, I can imagine. But please, if you take anything from it, just understand the nature of it. And the fact that it was encompassing many different struggles. We will go on to all the many campaigns. And it's not to say every single woman fought for every single campaign because of these different identities and these different communities and groups that each woman might have belonged to. The parameters for this movement of OAD and this umbrella um, group and organisation was quite broad and deliberately so. Okay, so Stella Dadzi, um, and I've watched an interview with her, a talk she had done recently, 
where she said that, and I quote, OED was a pragmatic response to a need that arose. There were lots of small independent women's groups, lots of women organising within other groups for different aims. Um, and this is where I wanted to talk about the, the politics of some of the women um, and where they were coming from. And especially in black liberation groups, women were often overshadowed by men and women's struggles were often, shall we say, tossed to the side a little bit um, and not taken as, as seriously as issues pertaining to men because there was this idea that, you know, if we sort out black men, then black men will help sort out black women later. But that's never the case. That never happens. Um, this idea of, you know, one person being liberated and then them reaching their hand down to help the others that need to also be liberated. It's this false ideology and it's not really ever proven to be accurate or a correct way of, of organising in the past. And so there were many women that were essentially resigned to domestic duties within movements for black liberation. And by black liberation... That's a very broad term because we're talking about black liberation in the UK. We're talking about anti-imperialist struggles in Africa and the Caribbean, independence movements in those countries as well. So this organising is not just limited to Britain. However, the geographical location of most of these people were Britain. So it made sense that there would be a group that women could organise under to look at their needs specifically um, and the needs that weren't necessarily being met by these wider groups for black liberation. Um, because let's be honest, you know, if you're thinking about something like a movement that is for protecting women against domestic violence and abuse, and, and we're looking at that in the case of black women, now, just by the fact that most black women at the time were married to black men, they would have been the perpetrators of that domestic violence. And so organising in a space with black men might have not been ideal. It would have been problematic. It may have been unhelpful and could also trigger or traumatise um, potential victims or survivors that now were trying to to make the situation better or create a space, a safe space for those that might be going through that at the time. So... There, there was a need for an umbrella group because there were women that were organising within other movements and they were still fighting for those causes. So even if, you know, they felt like there was a need to look at women's issues within a movement for black liberation, it's not like they didn't think that black liberation was important and some of the issues that might have been more mm, impactful to black men weren't still important and they didn't feel like they needed to work on them anymore. It was just a case that they also needed a space to work on, on issues pertaining to women. And so this umbrella was created. Now, on the other side, there was also women that came from the feminist movement. And I mentioned that some of the founders have said that they don't really um, align necessarily with feminism because feminism in Britain in the 1970s, it was you know made up of white women that were thinking about issues that affected them, and rightly so, but often not realising the different ways that these could issues could manifest within um, the black community or towards black women, and also the privilege that they had um, in these positions and over black women in some cases. And so there were women that came from that feminist ideology and framework, and they understood the systems, such as the patriarchy, and their politics were grounded in those systems and the dismantling of those systems, and they took those frameworks into OAD as well. So you've got those that have come from a more black nationalist, um, in the case of the Panthers, um, they've come with a black nationalist kind of mindset. You've got those that are looking at anti-imperialist struggles, outside of their work with women and they bring that and then you've got the women that are looking at feminism frameworks and they bring that so you have this quite a nice group and mix of women who have come from different um, organizing backgrounds um, hence why there was a need for this umbrella group um, you know they wanted to find a way to organize that was first of all woman friendly you know women have the burden of of childcare in some cases um obviously women in that in those times we're talking about working class women who have recently in some cases migrated to britain you know they had to work they had to earn money in the same ways their husbands did might not have been the case when we're looking at um feminist movements of british women that weren't working class who might have had time and money on their side 
Um, and so they wanted to create a group that was as rooted in their politics, you know, connecting struggles here in Britain and also in the diaspora, Africa, the Caribbean, um, and in some cases Asia, when Asian women started to, to get added to the mix. And so women, as I've mentioned, were kind of in some ways subsumed. I think black women were overlooked in, in women's movements, white women's movements and black liberation movements and so they needed a space to be in control of their own narratives and their own organizing and to have that independence essentially um i think the majority of women came actually from this kind of african liberation movements and contexts as opposed to there wasn't space for us in white feminist movements so we came here instead um because at that time racism in the UK was very very bad and so I don't really see many black women even maybe aligning with that politics don't quote me on that that is more of a of an in inference as opposed to fact I just thought I'd share some examples of some of the women that founded um, OAD and their politics before finding that movement um Mia Morris being the first um she focused on a lot of campaigns to do with women in healthcare looking at um contraception and the forced sterilization of some black and asian women in britain um at the time and education and the education system and the racism that was embedded into that system and so she kind of came into that context of organizing as a woman looking at issues very specifically to women and black girls in education so we have also gail lewis who is a sociologist who specializes in psychosocial studies of race and gender she came from a marxist ideology um, and her kind of narrative and her story essentially um which she's i've heard her speak on was that, you know, therapy and this idea of, like, mental health to an extent was this idea of, like, this petty bourgeois indulgence um, within a Marxist framework. Um, however, she was able to kind of rethink and relearn what therapy could do for black women and for herself. Um, and she ended up kind of working within things like mental health obviously um sociology um structural relations in regards to like abortion and not just looking at the structural relations framework of the fact that you know why are some women afforded a, an abortion um how do abortion laws impact different women but also the emotions um of women that might have had or not had abortions and, and the trauma that that might have caused and by looking at things outside of a marxist lens i think she was able to kind of not necessarily, you know, get rid of her Marxist ideologies and leanings because they she's clearly rooted in them um, in her activism, but also consider um, the kind of psychosocial side of of these these um, systems that are in place in Britain. And Stella Dadzi, who was working on campaigns in the UK, um, but for movements pertaining to African liberation, um, especially in Ghana, um, which is where her father was from, and so. You know, we've got this kind of mix of, of different ideologies looking just at those three three women that were part of the founding members, let alone, you know, you've got people like Olive Morris that came from the Black Panthers and so is rooted in this black nationalist ideology um, and brought those politics into it. And so, as you can see, there's just a real mix of, of different political ideologies. Maybe we should do an episode on political ideologies um, and how they impact movements for black liberation. Sounds more like an essay to me, though feel like those topics don't come across as well on the podcast but if you disagree let me know and we maybe we can think about that for for future episodes now as i've mentioned oad really grounded women in activism i believe these movements you know whilst oad didn't actually live very long as an organization um and we can get into the the dates and times of all that later um but these movements lived on you know, in people's workplaces as separate organisations in, in different countries. The politics of the conferences and the talks and the events that took place under OAD have clearly been sustained and continue to lay the groundwork for movements um, pertaining to women's liberation and black women's liberation in this country today. So I wanted to talk about some of the issues that OAD campaigned on and then we'll talk about their conferences and their um, publications and everything else that they did. 
I'll just give you a whistle-stop tour of some of the issues campaigned on. So immigration and deportation laws, as I've said, this is the 70s and 80s, and so black people, Asian people are still um, new, new to Britain and newly moving into the country, and so are dealing with immigration issues, potentially. Domestic violence within the house, of course, um, an issue for women across the board, um, but something that was overshadowed maybe in other spaces. The exclusion of children from schools. We've had many episodes on on the education system. I don't want to get into it too much, but that was a big issue. Most of the women in these groups were mothers and they took their role as mothers very seriously because education was seen as the only way that their children could have a better life, you know? Social mobility, it really relied on a good education and that is what a lot of Caribbean and African women brought their children to the UK for for a better education and a better life and so these exclusions um these ESN schools that they were ending up in were a problem and if you've watched the small act series um, by Steve McQueen the final episode which is about the schooling system you can see black women you can see exactly what black women do to try and challenge um the institutional racism in the education system if you haven't watched that watch that if you want to know more about ESNs educationally subnormal schools there's an episode on that I think it's like oh I don't know way, way back way back one of the like first 10 episodes I think Okay, back to my list. So industrial action um, by black women in the workplace uh, in a similar way that trade unions would work, but a lot of trade unions didn't allow black members. And so that was something that had to be fought within this kind of umbrella uh, organisation. Policing and defence policies. Police brutality was not just impacting black men. Um, There are so many black women that have been killed at the hands of police in British history. Their names often go forgotten. And so that was something else that had to be uh, protested and campaigned against. Health and reproductive rights. There were so many instances of uh, medical racism, which we know, you know, the mortality rates for black women in childbirth are atrocious compared to their white counterparts. They were not much better then. And things like uh, the forced sterilisation of women from marginalised communities, the drug Depo Provera, That is a whole episode in itself. Honestly, it's on my to-do list of episodes for this podcast because what was happening with that contraceptive injection um, and the way it was used um, for black women was, again, sickening. Also, you know, OAD held a sit-in at Heathrow Airport to protest virginity tests being carried out on Asian uh, female immigrants to test their residency and marriage claims. Basically, essentially, as an Asian woman, you would land at the airport, you would be taken aside and asked to open your legs so that they could check if you were a virgin. Now, you you know, if you haven't thrown your phone across the room, yeah, exactly. Absolutely ridiculous in all senses of the word and practice. But essentially, the UK government were trying to make sure that women weren't coming here to join um, a husband and that they were they were virgins um, and they hadn't already married and were just using the status to migrate yeah as it's as messed up as it sounds um, and so they held a sit-in at Heathrow airport and you know whilst this was an issue that was directly impacting Asian women because of the beliefs about their culture and practices it wasn't something that just Asian women protested about you know the solidarity um, of, of black and Asian women at this time was very clear and I really liked that about OAD actually um, because these issues and a lot of the issues that were affecting black women were affecting Asian women too and at that time when there are so few immigrants um, from kind of any country it helps to unify. Um, we now I think where our numbers are higher and our struggles are slightly more different and diverse maybe it is more damaging to, to unify and to kind of work under under one umbrella or, or one organisation. I think back then it was a clear strength to the movement. So OAD held conferences um, starting in 1979 with a conference in Brixton. And I believe they had four before the a kind of movement like stopped to exist 
as we we knew it um, to exist in the past. And so the first conference in Brixton had a panel of speakers that spoke on education, immigration, the health service, employment, and all the issues that I kind of mentioned they campaigned about in like the previous section of this podcast. And so hundreds of women came together, different groups of women from different backgrounds, from different organising frameworks and political ideologies, And they came with their own personal experiences of racism and sexism. And some women were still kind of grappling with different ideas of sexuality and how they identified in that way. And that was another issue that many women um, didn't really have a space for or to organise within um, as black women. And so women came, not necessarily in some cases, already having a political framework or having a space to talk about their experiences. And this just gave space and gave voice to those women that were going through something which the mainstream um, was not acknowledging. And, you know, the movements that they might have found themselves in, such as women, white women's feminism or black liberation movements, they weren't really scratching that itch, shall we say. Um, And so they found themselves at these OAD conferences from all around the country. Women would come. Women would come from different movements and different groups in order to, to have these conversations and to just unify. And I think there's something beautiful in solidarity. Um, but I think OAD provided a space to do that. And that space had not existed prior to OAD. OAD was quite a short-lived movement in some ways. It ended in about 1983. However, you know, it had created so many subgroups um, and the legacies had been left. And also, um, a book, a book was born out of this beautiful movement. um, And I think this book really, really encapsulates what the founding members were trying to achieve in creating OAD. Now, The Heart of the Race, as I've mentioned by Beverly Bryan, Stella Dadzi and Suzanne Shave, was originally published by Virago, which is a feminist publisher, in 1985. It was republished recently in 2018 by Verso as a feminist classic. Um, And, you know, it is a unique piece in its writing style, in its source material, in the way it has been collated there I don't think there's actually a book like it and I don't think there really ever will be a book like it um if you haven't read this book I would definitely read it it's the best book that exists um within black British history did I just say that I did I'm gonna stick to that (laughs) so I just wanted to read out the introduction which is entitled the ties that bind not all of it don't worry um but just the first part because I think it really highlights why they wrote this book Um, and what the book's about in in a very quick way. The Ties That Bind. When we first came together to write this book, it was because we felt that it was high time we started to record our versions of events. From where we stood as black women in Britain in the 1980s, over the past 10 years, we had seen the appearance of volumes of material documenting our struggles as black people. And of course, we welcomed this, for we had relied for too long on the version of our story put forward by white historians and sociologists. And we had seen the women's movement follow suit, documenting her story from every angle except our own. But despite the efforts of black men and white women to ensure that we were no longer hidden from history, there was still a gaping silence from black women. Thanks to our sisters in the United States, the silence is at last beginning to be broken, and for the first time ever, black women have a voice. But that voice comes from America, and although it speaks directly to our experience in Britain, it does not speak directly of it. I thought that was a really important part of the um, the book to share because not only does it highlight, you know, the fact that black women were not being written about under the kind of guise of black liberation, but also um, white women's feminism. Um, and so black women in Britain you know, their stories aren't being told. And the fact that um, they've linked their storytelling and their coming to voice with those black women in America that were also beginning to, you know, write down their stories, um, to theorise their experiences, Um, you know, the black women in feminism. When you think about black feminists, you would often go to the Audre Lords, the Toni Morris, the Angela Davises, the Bell Hooks, you know, Kimberly Crenshaw, 
you wouldn't necessarily go to black British women because um, black American women, African American women, they laid that foundation in the years before for black women started to to really come to voice in a way that they were listened to, shall we say. Don't get me wrong, that's not to say black women haven't written a book before this one, because of course they have. Um, but I think in a way that really highlights the experiences of black women written by black women, um, you know, women have been interviewed for this book um, in abundance. And even the way that the book is written, it's written in the first person. It's written as if to say, you know, we, we as black women, this is our story. We were enslaved, um, you know, due to colonisation and um, imperialism. We were this, we were that. And now we are going to, to talk about what life is like now. And one thing I really like about this book are the sections. So we've got Labour Pains, Black Women and Work, Learning to Resist, Black Women in Education, The Uncaring Arm of the State, Black Women Healthcare and the Welfare Services, Chain Reactions, Black Women Organising, Self-Consciousness, Understanding Our Culture and Identity. Um, and then there's a list of historical black women's groups in there, which is also very interesting um, to go through because obviously this was written in the 19... published in the 1980s, and so it's kind of nice to, to know what was happening in regards to activism then. This book takes extracts from interviews done with black women. It really highlights and exemplifies the struggles, but also the fact that I think, for the most part, when one woman says she's having this struggle, for example... The nurses went on strike um, in the 19, late 1970s, early 1980s um, due to pay um, and there were issues with the way that shifts were being allocated and that sort of thing. Um, you get to hear the kind of perspective from not just one black nurse, but several. And so it's kind of like they corroborate each of the stories without even realising just the way that the, the narrative is put together. Um, and I, w I don't want to kind of spoil it, essentially, even though it's like, you know, it's not a fiction book um but i won't say too much more than that um but i would definitely urge you to have a read um i think it is quite often the case that when we read about black history in britain um we often don't think about black women's everyday experiences um that are specific to black women you know we look at like oh black communities would have been oppressed by the police of so brutality but what about black women specifically? What were they going through? Do you know, what, what was their life like? What was it like to raise children? What was it like to be a mother? What was it like to be a teacher or a nurse? Um, and I guess that's what my research has been um, in the past few months and years, um, especially my dissertation, because I kind of thought, you know, it's always well and good us looking at individual, exceptional black women and black men um, in British history but what about the, like, everyday lives of black women? What about their everyday struggles? What did they do? What did they go through just to kind of live and survive um, and thrive in some cases? The Heart of the Race um, started as kind of an academic piece and it still is an academic piece, although there is often a lot of backlash um, against oral history, um, often branded in academia as, as not real history. Um, it's my historical um method of choice um i use histor oral history because we come from oral cultures um as descendants of africa how else can you tell our histories without using the oral traditions especially and i take this from um, a comment stella dadzi made especially when our history is hidden you know this isn't we're not going through the archives looking at documentation or looking at articles or looking at things that existed at the time because they don't exist and if they do they are so hidden that to find them requires a certain level of privilege that most black women um that are kind of trying to do this research and this work might not have and so you know these oral histories are vital and it's been a very long time that academia doesn't recognize oral history as being a serious academic pursuit you know it said that real historians are digging deep in the archives and doing all that work. Well, I'm sorry, but, you know, the Windrush generation, in some cases, are alive and well and have got stories to tell that aren't necessarily in the archives. So these oral histories have to be collated and 
you know, their book alone as a resource resource for historians trying to do this work is phenomenal. You know, when the archives closed, um, it was my crutch because there was no other way to, to get these histories um, in a national lockdown. Um, also, it's at this point I would like to mention the Black Cultural Archives who are preserving these histories, all the pamphlets and all the publications from OAD. They had a publication called FOAD, Um, which is a newsletter um, where they gave, you know, reading lists. They wrote articles about activism and organising that was happening. And it was another way of communicating with those black women, Asian women that might have wanted to find out what was going on and be kind of kept up to date. Uh, Publications were common in in movements for black liberation and um, feminist movements and just general organising. Publications are always key. They still occur today. Um, And so the archive at the Black Cultural Archives is quite wonderful in a sense of that publication exists and they have physical copies of that that you can look through um, and base your research from they have papers they have letters they have pamphlets honestly the archive is phenomenal they have the book in the archive as well although you can just buy it um but they have the original um publication from virago which has the original cover which is absolutely stunning the new cover is also stunning but still um, it's kind of good to see that as well. This is why I think it's very important that we have spaces like the Black Cultural Archives that are preserving this history and this heritage so that you know future historians can write about these things Um, and they have done and they have used these archives and these sources in the past in order to to write this history which so desperately needs to be written after being hidden for so long. In 1982 the organisation ceased to exist and there were many reasons for that There were in some ways divisions um, with maybe women that were breaking away from some of the group in terms of what they wanted to focus on and it maybe not fitting within the framework of OWAD. Um, But I don't want to dwell on the kind of end of the organisation as something really bad, really sad and really negative and a failing of these women to to continue and keep this movement going on and on forever. You know, all things have to come to an end at some point. And I feel like the seeds of this organisation were embedded so deeply into so many women's groups and women's movements that... You know, the frameworks, the methods for organising, the grassroots, community-based level of these um, these women were very clear. Um, not just for women of that day, but for women of the future. We use their tactics today, and I think their legacy lives on in the physical and symbolic spaces that we now inhabit. And I do not think that, you know, dwelling on the, the kind of... I don't even want to use the word demise. The end of OAD as it was, you know, doing conferences, doing talks, doing... Um, the publication of FOAD, I don't think that's helpful to the narrative of OAD. I didn't want to just highlight individual women um, when we were looking at OAD because that's exactly what OAD stood against, this idea of, like, exceptionalism in one individual, this one leader that we all kind of put on a pedestal and look up to. No, OAD was a collective, it was an organisation and it was an umbrella term for many groups and women's movements and... It was a force for good for black women in this country and continues to to live on throughout our organising. And so with that, I will say thank you for listening to this episode. Um, If you're listening on International Women's Day, then have a great day and think about maybe what you can do in your life um, to better the lives of other women around you. And that might be something at home. That might be something in the workplace. might be something um, in your social groups or your friends. Um, But have a think about that and have a great week. Thank you so much for listening. Goodbye.